Okay, if you take your seats, please. Okay, this is our final lecture of, of the today's session. Um, uh, this is a real importance one particularly as well. Um, I, I spent last night leaping through Doug's wonderful book, Freeze Frame, an extraordinary collection of images there. And I was trying to discover how will I summarize uh, Doug's career in a few lines. It's, it's extraordinarily difficult, but you'll see much of it on the screen. But I just came across this wonderful quote from Sir David Attenborough, um, and it was a legend for, for most of us as well, but he describes Doug uh, in the following terms, if you can find it here, yeah. He is a man who is immune to most of the limitations that govern other humans. Good Lord. <laughs> Doug Allen. Some of them are extremely hard to find. Slightly more easy bit then. The reason that, I mean, why go to the polls? Well, for me, it, it's partly, it is a tough place, which is enjoyable, but it's also a very beautiful place. You know, when the light, light is everything for, for a photographer, for a camera person, and when the light is right in the polls, it's just, you know, like nowhere else, but it's also quite ephemeral. You know, that iceberg is on the move, it's turning in the current, it's, um, you know, and that particular shaft of sunlight is only going to illuminate it for a while. So you grab the pictures when you can, and um, that somehow, you know, makes them all the more special. Um, the one on the right, on the, on the right hand side, that was actually New Year's Day in the Antarctic, and it was the only one up and sober enough to keep the clouds in focus. Um, but really, I mean, the Antarctic Peninsula, if you get the chance to go down there, wonderful. It's like you've taken the top 2,000 metres off the Himalayas and brought them right down to sea level. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, we've seen Roald Amundsen in the shadows. I wondered if this is this Roald Amundsen in a nice shadow. <laughs> He's looking a bit rugged. <laughs> These shelves are, are particularly exciting places, glaciers, and anyone who's been to Svalbard or the Antarctic out in a Zodiac cruise amongst the icebergs, everybody always wants the driver of the Zodiac to go as close as you can to the iceberg or the ice cliff so you can see what's going on. All I would say is be careful. That is an enormous block right at the top. That whole front is going to go at some point.
I sort of, I, I went to, I got into diving, I went to university, did a degree in marine biology and decided that I wanted to, to go on various <laughs> expeditions and to stick with the diving and the biology but not sort of science at the sharp ends. And this was one of the first great ones. This one actually brought me to Ireland because I've got a wee house in Galway and the reason I bought it there is because I got done very well with Pete Vine, who was uh, um, a scientist on this expedition. Anyway, we were studying this um, starfish out in the Red Sea. We wanted to study it day and night for two to three weeks. And the only way to do that was to live on the reef. So we built ourselves this platform on the reef and equipped it all up for living on. So we had, uh, we slept upstairs, we kind of cooked downstairs, we got a shelter. And we had two drums, one for fresh water and one for um, fuel. Fresh water was in a little bit of short supply. And basically, <laughs> we could put about two and, a, two and a half, three inches of fresh water in the bottom of the baby's bath about every three days or so. And then there was five of us living on the platform and we drew straws <laughs> to see who got to wash first. <laughs> So you couldn't change the water you know, in between, so it was progressively getting sold. Anyway, so that's me, that's me out there in the Red Sea in, in 1974. Um, it's funny, you know, I showed this picture to, um, to a group of, of people in, in the UK, the Women's Institute, it's called. <laughs> <laughs> There's some wonderful old women in the Women's Institute. And this, this, this wonderful old lady came up to me at the end and she said, Mr. Allen, <laughs> I really enjoyed your slides, but I couldn't help noticing that you're not a natural blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, fair dues. <laughs> fair dues, there's nothing wrong with your eyes here. What you've got to remember is that I learned to dive in Scotland, which is kind of like Ireland. It's a great place to learn to dive. And, you know, but you get currents, you get rough seas, poor visibility. So going out to the Red Sea was really pretty fantastic. Anyway, it's certainly good, but the real one, cold one, was when I went to the Antarctic in 1976. And uh, I worked for the British Antarctic Survey for, first of all, one winter and then two winters on this base called Sydney Island, which was a great place, absolutely fantastic. This is Sydney in the sort of summer, we used to get pack ice, we used to occasionally come in. There was about 25 people there in the summer. Um, but then it really got special in the winter. Round about March, the last ship call would come in, the last ship of the season, and the ship would leave, and it would leave about 12 to 14 men in those days, only men, no women, unfortunately. But then um, we'd leave 12 to 14 men on base for the winter. The winter lasted from April until late November when the ship could come down again. And the base just completely got transformed because the sea would freeze all round about it. And then everything changed. We could do travelling, we could take the snow machines across to the faraway island, we could do climbing, we could do all sorts of things. And we carried on diving, um, except that we had to obviously use pretty big bladed chainsaws to get down through the ice into underwater. So you go out, you cut yourself a chainsaw, use yourself a chainsaw, and you basically cut two parallel cuts about this wide, two parallel cuts coming this way, and then three that go across the way. And if you angle the chainsaw right, you end up with two free-floating blocks in the hole. Now, they're too heavy to lift out, but you can bounce them up and down with a chisel, big, big long handle chisel. You can push them down underneath, push them to one side, and then they freeze in next to the ice, and that's you've got your dive hole. Um, and this is sort of standard diving technique for underneath the ice. You go down on a safety line, usually. Now, what surprised me was the sort of life that you saw down there. Out on the, the flat bottom seabed, down to 10, 20 metres, it was fairly bereft of life. Well, bereft of a certain kind of life, lots of seaweed and stuff, but nothing slow growing and attached to the bottom because the icebergs would come along and they would just scour everything off the bottom. But once you got in underneath the overhangs, then you could find all these soft corals and sponges and anemones and all this sort of exciting stuff. There were fish down there, not uh, a huge range of fish, but uh, this was an ice fish. And the other thing about uh, all the fish in the Antarctic is that they all have to have antifreeze in their blood. Because the sea temperature in the winter is minus 1.8 degrees centigrade, 
and in the summer it gets much warmer, it gets up to about plus a half in the summer. <laughs> but um, the fact is if you drop any normal fish into those sort of temperatures, the, the blood just turns into sort of sluggy, sluggy of ice crystals. So all the fish have got ice and um, antifreeze in their blood to keep their blood flowing. But it's also very rich in oxygen, so actually this thing um, is white because it doesn't have any hemoglobin in its blood. The oxygen just, just dissolves straight into it, sort of body and straight into its um, arteries and things. Um, so that's ice fish, it's white, it's got antifreeze and that's how it goes. Um, things are big in the Antarctic. This is, um, I can not remember if it's an amphipod or an isopod, you have to help me any biologists out there. One of them, amphipods and isopods, one of them's flattened that way and the other one's flattened that way and this one's obviously flattened that way. So I think it's an, I think it's an amphipod. Anyway, your average amphipod around the UK might be a centimetre at the most long, whereas this thing here is about this long, it's about, you know, eight or nine centimetres long. And this is another thing you get in the Antarctic, you get gigantism. Here's another one, a sea spider. Again, you get sea spiders, you know, off the coast here, but you're looking at something that's maybe a couple of centimetres across the legs. This one here is about 20 centimetres across the legs. But of course the best thing in the Antarctic, almost anywhere actually, is to dive for the mammals. And um, the mammals, the, the, the seals in the Antarctic are particularly friendly, I think, because they don't have many um, enemies, and certainly they're quite curious. And these guys here, these are crab eater seals, which are probably the, the, the commonest, the most numerous seal in the Antarctic is a crab eater seal. They're somewhere between about 5 and 20 million crab eater seals are in the Antarctic. The reason that we're not sure of the numbers is because they're quite hard to, to measure um, because they, they live in the pack ice and they're hard to think. Anyway, things were going well. I did one winter, then I did two winters. The second time I went down with much better camera equipment. But then in January 1981, that was when I met the man who took me in a new direction. That was when I met David. Now, David came onto our base with a very small film crew. It was just David, cameraman, sound man and producer. And they came onto our base for only two days. And it fell to me to help them, uh, to take them around the island to where the, the good scenic spots were, taken to the animals, where David did pieces to camera about the animals. This was for David's second series, Living Planet. And then, um, basically by the end of two days, I was talking to all of them and, and asking them how can I get into this business because it seemed to me like the camera person on that on that crew, Hugh was his name, Hugh Maynard, it seemed like he just had the best job in the world. He was doing all the things that I enjoyed. He was diving, working with animals, working with people like David and Ned, the sound man. After the Antarctic, they were going to Galapagos for a month, you know, and, and the idea of swapping from the Antarctic to the Galapagos and then somewhere else was just great. So, um, so I asked them how it would be and they told me about if it would be freelance and they also implied that it was quite good to have a specialist. In other words, David said at one point, he said, you know, if I want to go to Africa, there's any number of people I can talk to about elephants or chimps or anything there, but if I come back to the Antarctic, or when I come back to the Antarctic, I'll come to you, because you seem to know about staying warm and diving and how to handle, how to move around about the penguins, etc. So he was kind of implying, if you want to get into this business, play to your strengths. So that was what I did in a way. Now, I should say, David's not the, well, he's probably the most, probably the most best known person that I have had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with, but I have spent time with um, people who, having met me, having met me, they then become even more famous. <laughs> fairly close to it because that Shackleton's route that he followed, there tends to be this slightly more open water across to the east side of the Weddell Sea and the ships can get down there a bit further south than they would do normally, but the ice at the bottom is still very heavy. 
Anyway, we built down, we went down there for summer and we built this new station called Halley Station uh, down there. So that's what it looked like at the end of the summer. Now, right about the Antarctic, the sea ice comes and goes through the, through the seasons. Let's see if this thing works. Back on the back a bit. There we are. This is the sort of time lapse of the sea ice. So that's the middle of summer. And then as the spring comes on in the winter, you'll see that the sea ice expands out. And in the middle of winter, the sea ice effectively doubles the size of the Antarctic. It doubles it from about six and a half square kilometers to about 15 square kilometers. And then in the summer, it dips back down again. Now it's on that sea ice, it's on that sea ice through the winter, that's where you find the emperor penguins. Emperor penguins don't breed on land, they breed on the sea ice. And they breed through the winter because they're much bigger than the other penguins. And basically, if they're going to have their chicks ready to go to sea in the summer, they have to start breeding through the winter. Um, I'll just show you this picture. <laughs> um, you know, it wasn't just us that was, um, you know, shooting, uh, you know, wearing a skirt, etc. Uh, skirts were up to it long before that. This is, from the, this is from the Scottish Antarctic Expedition, which went down in 1903, and it was a very successful expedition. It went down specifically all Scottish, because the backer decided that anything that feckin' English could do. <laughs> So the sea ice forms in March and the penguins, the emperor penguins come back and, and, and down at Halley we had the, the, the machinery uh, to go up, to go up and down to the colonies through the winter. So sometimes we would go down using the base snow carts, um, which was pretty comfortable. Other times we would go down in the, before the, the, before the darkness came, let's say, we would go down on the snow machines. <clears throat> it was a fairly straightforward route, but there were one or two holes in the ice, in the, in the ice shelf itself. Well, you had to be pretty careful to keep well clear of it. Um, but I remember there was one day we went down, but it was a bit of a white out. I misread the snow machine, and then um, the guy in front who was leading, he ended up going up a, a crevasse, and basically we were, we were roped together with the snow machines, um, and he dropped uh, the machine a little bit down one of these holes. Uh, luckily, it just jammed a little way down, but so we were able to get it out, and then once we got it out, we went down. <laughs> had a look, uh, you know, that we might have ended up going down. But anyway, I always believe in all's well that ends well in a Mrs. as good as a mile. So. <laughs> um, and then the eggs, so anyway, the eggs come back and they get together the male and female, and the female lays a single egg, usually about late May, early June, and she then leaves that egg. It's been very energy demanding her producing that egg. She leaves that egg with the male, and it's the male who looks after the egg for the whole two months of the incubation. And they haven't got any nest sites or anything, so the male rolls the eggs onto his feet, tucks it between his legs, wears a bare patch of skin, and he shuffles around with that egg for the two months during which the egg will incubate and eventually <laughs> the egg will hatch. And all these eggs, um, some of them, you can see they've got, um, they've got uh, these one here, see the wee bulbs here? They've got, they're sitting there with an egg, they've got an egg tucked underneath there. <clears throat> very, very cold in the winter. You know, minus 40, minus 50, with wind chill thrown in the top. So the emperor penguins huddle together, and it's really, really effective, that huddling. Um, scientists put little thermometers, glued them to the bottom of uh, the penguin's back, and were able to go down to the colonies, and they got a temperature and a position to within a metre of where those penguins were. And they found that the penguins, who had thermometers on, who had their backs to the wind, they would be recorded at minus 40, 50. The guys in the middle of the huddle, be plus 20. That's how warm it was. That's how warm it was. Now they didn't exactly take it, turn about, but the ones on the outside are sort of slowly shuffling their way into the middle, and the ones at the front are being pushed out and they come mm -hmm. back through and things. So they all get a chance in the middle. And so you don't see many emperor penguins you know, dying through the winter because of frostbite. Oh. And then we check the uh, hatch. And then over the next four, four months or so, they will grow up and they start. You know, the adults start going back and forward to food. And it's all wonderfully tight because in the middle of winter, that ice edge might be 30, 40 miles away. So the female, once she's given the egg to the male, she goes out, she swims in that open water, feeds up, comes back, and then she takes over feeding the chick because she comes back just as the chick sort of hatches. 
Um, and then they'll both take it in turn of swapping over. And all the time they're swapping over, the chicks get bigger, chicks needing more food, but the ice edge is getting closer. So eventually the ice edge is quite close to the colony. By this time the, the young imps are nearly ready, they're almost fledged, they've lost their grey downy feathers, they're about to go to sea, and uh, they'll be ready to go to sea. And it's not quite the end of the story because waiting <coughs> in the water. <coughs> Might be a fit of life. I gave this one a title, there's a title of that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, some animals eat other animals, that's just the way it is. That's like very real stuff, I think. Anyway, look, there's two camera people, or two photographers who are particularly um, impressive in the annals of the and I'll say, Albert Ponting is one, and um, he did some lovely stuff. He went down with Scott. To be honest, he was a, a wee bit boring, a wee bit Victorian, a wee bit traditional for my liking, and I much prefer the uh, photographer of Hurley, who went down with um, Shackleton. Um, Hurley's classic portrait of Tom Green and other members of the crew was just beautiful. And there's Hurley up the mast, you know, cranking away at his camera um, up there. And so Harley, I reckon Hurley was. He was a, the next generation of camera people, although they were, although they were um, down at the same time, probably somehow caught more of it. But it was quite a difference to what um, the sort of gear that we now take down, um, which is basically a computer with a lens in front of it. But it doesn't matter. The main thing is it's the photography that is the priority. You always have to give that your first crack. So here's a little bit, um, a little bit of a story that Sue, my wife at the time, Sue and I got to what did I talk about? Myself and my husband, Doug Allen, flew to Tonga to film the humpback whales. It was one of the most fabulous experiences I've had working as a wildlife filmmaker. When you have a big 45 foot model looking you in the eye from just a couple of metres away, you establish this bond with them. It's really, really special. I was filming Doug as he was filming the mum and calf and I looked over the top of the camera and realised the calf was just a couple of feet away and all of a sudden it turned and kind of just flipped its tail and whacked me in the leg and it just felt like someone had hit me with a sledgehammer. I screamed and dropped the camera which slowly started going glug glug glug. Now I was faced with this choice um, Floating, screaming, Sue, save that, or go for the camera. This kind of screaming life and the camera. Uh, unfortunately, there was no contest, so he swam down and got the camera. One of these days, I might forgive Doug for rescuing the camera instead of me. Maybe. <laughs> Safety. Um, and at the time when I saw this photograph, I thought, well, it's a bit of a tall story, that one. I'm not sure if that would happen. But I actually did end up having the chance to see something like that. We went on a trip to film killer whales down the peninsula. So you make your way through the Falklands and then you go across the Drake Passage to get to the peninsula. Falklands there really is a place which is more, more English than England, really. Uh, it, it looks like it's modernised a bit now, but certainly as you pull out of the jetty, it looks like an English village from the sort of fifties or sixties. You go for a walk around the gardens, come <laughs> <laughs> with even more of that impression. Uh, and you've also got a very, very strong impression that they are absolutely British. There is no way that the photos, <laughs> no way the photos are going to go back to Argentina, not as long as the people have got it. We go there because we're going to go down with this man, Jerome, who runs this boat. This is the Golden Fleece, which is whose skipper is a guy called Jerome, a Frenchman. And Fred Jerome has been going to the peninsula for many, many years, since 74. He went originally in a 40-foot sailing yacht, but he's now moving up to the S60. 
So we've got lots of gear, we've got many people always travel with lots of gear, but all that fits on board and it, the, the fleece is nice and comfortable, it's got a, a, a side to side um, lounge in it and uh, Jerome and the crew sleep forward and then the camera crew sleeps aft in a couple of cabins there, small galley kitchen, what have you. Ideal sort of numbers on the, on the fleece would be about six or seven really, three in the crew and then three of the camera crew, that would be more or less ideal, you can put more on but what have you. Anyway, like I said, we're going to go from the Falklands down to the Antarctic Peninsula, which involves crossing the Drake Passage, which is a hairy bit of water, because as you can see back here, the winds around the Antarctic blow perpetually in a clockwise direction around the continent, but there's no land mass to interrupt their fetch. So the fetch, which is the distance of open water across which the wind blows, the fetch is just limitless. And so they pile up these huge, huge swells, which eventually have to squeeze their way between that 700 mile gap between the bottom of South America and the top of the Falklands. So it does get quite lumpy, it can get quite lumpy. It's not unknown to get, you know, a swell which will take out the bridge windows on cruise ships. And these bridge windows are 12 metres above the, you know, between the bottom of the swell and the top. So it's a bit hairy and you kind of get a good prediction, good weather forecast for about a couple of days, but then after that it's a bit iffy. So sometimes the fleece can get caught out because it takes about three days to get over the drink passage in the fleece. But once you get down to the peninsula, the river is much calmer, there's more ice down there, you've lost the worst of the depressions and it's really much better. Now for this particular film, <coughs> film we shoot, we had two cameras, because we were after something quite rare, so we had one camera system which looked like a normal camera, but underneath the top of the tripod there was a set of gimbals, and um, these two things are gyros, one is going in this direction, one is at 90 degrees, and one gyro will take the roll out of the ship, and the other gyro will take the pitch out of the ship. So basically with that on top of your tripod, the ship moves underneath, but the camera itself stays pretty steady on the top. So you can use a long lens off, you know, off a normal tripod. But we also have this thing which <coughs> had much bigger lenses inside it. And this thing you'd normally put on a helicopter. And inside this is a fancy gimbal camera system with a big long telephoto lens, which all the controls come down to a control panel, which you can keep in the bridge. And with that, you can move the camera right and left, up and down, zoom in and out, change all the parameters that you would do normally. But it just basically, because it's so super sophisticated, you can't use even longer lenses on this one. So, <clears throat> there was two camera people on the ship, myself and another, Doug, Doug Anderson, and we swapped it around. Sometimes I would drive the, the Cineflex, sometimes I would drive the other one. And then um, we had <clears throat> two very good scientists with us who studied killer wheels. And these guys were great. We would always spend lots of time up on top of the, standing on top of the wheelhouse, looking out to see with the binoculars, trying to pick up the killer wheels. And yeah, it didn't take us long to find the killer whales, but a lot of the time the killer whales didn't do very much, they didn't do what we were looking for. But we did prove that you could follow the ship, you know, almost indefinitely, uh, keeping the killer whales in sight. If the killer whales had not, you know, if they hadn't liked the ship and they'd moved away, it would have been a problem. But as it was, we managed to get to them. And then finally we got one group who went into the back ice, split up, started looking up with their heads and began to give us what we wanted. The wolves of the sea move on in search of easier quarry. A widow seal, that's better. These are more docile and easier to tackle. The park stays close together and travels silently. This time, they unleash a far more powerful wave, and with astonishing accuracy. These big waves are not intended to break the ice, but to knock the prey into the water, and they rarely fail.
the hunt is far from over. They need to grab their prey by the tail while avoiding its snapping jaws. Only then will they be able to pull it down and drown it. Side swipes create violent underwater turbulence, a new tactic. gives cover for others to lunge at the seal's tail. Somehow the seal manages to reach a tiny ice well. The killers could easily grab it, but now this seems to have become a game. The seal's life hangs on a roll of the ice. Yet again, the pod joins forces to dislodge the seal. seals, fur seals, they just left them alone. Um, so they've got to recognise the seal and then decide, you know, who's going to make the wave and who's going to catch the seal or look after the seal when it comes off the ice floe, etc, etc. Um, so it was very impressive. It was the first time that I'd been, you know, filmed in any sort of, well, filmed at all, to be honest. So it was very satisfying getting that. The holy grail with any filmmaker is to get what you want. Um, there was some underwater in that, but that was done with, uh, with a remote camera over the side of the, the boat. We did think about diving in the same water with the killer whales, and I think that would have been, would have been perfectly safe. The killer whales are far too intelligent to, to sort of go for a, for a dive in the water. But it was a very frenzied scene, lots of flippers going everywhere, and also the, the ice floats being pushed around. So actually a diver in the water would have struggled to keep up and to see what was happening, whereas with the boat we could you know, stay where the ice floe was, which is where we knew the action was, dip the camera in and, and get all those sort of shots and put it together. Anyway, let me take you on a, on a proper dive, so to speak, underwater. I'm going to go to McMurdo. Um, this is a big American station. Now, when you fly to McMurdo, you know what the Americans are like. We haven't, we haven't got the Americans here. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you know what the Americans are like. They do things big, so you don't mess around with a little bit of a You get a big proper airplane that takes you from Christchurch down to McMurdo. And uh, this is a converted C-17, um, and it can take uh, either about 50 tonnes of cargo or up to 200 people, depending. We have a sort of double up, um, half cargo, half people. And um, it's much better going down. I went down before in the old Hercules, and when you find out in the Hercules, which is a turbo prop, you get to the point of no return, which is about halfway down, where the pilot has to decide, I'm going to Antarctica and I'm going to have to land, or if the weather's looking a bit iffy, I'll turn back and see if we haven't got enough fuel to go down and come back. These planes do, so it's a bit more relaxing going down. They don't like to boomerang back because it's expensive, but they can't do it. So anyway, so you fly down, and then eventually you can look down and you can see the McMurdo airstrip, so to speak. It's not really an airstrip because it's on, it's on the edge of the giant floating Ross ice shelf. The Ross ice shelf is a big ice shelf, it's like a floating glacier. And when I say big, the Ross ice shelf is the same size as France. 
So we are on the very outermost edge of the Ross Ice Shelf. Ice is hundreds of feet thick, and the Americans have been out and bulldozed the top of it so that these planes can come and land on their wheels. These are much too big to have skis fitted to them. So these planes come in, they land on their wheels on the ice front wing. Um, and it's a very slick operation. They, they, they come in, they taxi around, they stop, and then sometimes they just keep the engines running if they're going to do a quick turnaround. Keep the engines running, the back will drop down, the cargo comes out, boom, straight onto special cargo sledges, it gets towed away with the uh, D9 bulldozers. And this is all within sight of the Scott and Shackleton's huts. When Scott and Shackleton walked to the pole, if the route they followed would pretty much take them under the wingtip. You know, that's how much we've come on in a hundred years. You know, it took us a week from the UK for landing in the Antarctic. That's, whereas it took Shackleton Brothers, you know, a year from leaving New Zealand to being ready to, to set to, to set off with a walk. That's how much things have come on. And that's about Erebus in the, in the distance. And the, the people come off, um, and it's about minus 35 at this time of year. It's the middle of October, the first flight in after the winter. People get off and they get on the wonderfully named Ivan the Terrabus. <laughs> and Ivan the Terrabus is nice and long, and Ivan the Terrabus will whip you from it's the, the eight miles from the base, from the airstrip back to the base. So you follow across a well flagged route because although you know the, the top of the ice, top of the ice shelf is pretty flat, but there are undulations which fill with soft snow. And if you go into one of these low-lying bits, then even something like the six-wheel drive, either the terrorbus will get bogged down. And if it's a whiteout, you want to be able to follow the, the stakes. So you follow the stakes and you turn the corner as you approach, and there you have McMurdo down in front of you. It's a big base, there are about 1,500 people pass through McMurdo in a season. And at any one time, you could have 250 or 300 people, maybe even more living there. They use some science at McMurdo, but it's more a kind of staging post for people fly in there and then they fly out in smaller twin authors to the field camps around. About 15 miles from McMurdo is Shackleton's old base, which we were lucky enough to go and visit. Um, it's now been very well restored, um, or what bits of it need to be restored by the New Zealanders. Um, and it's just wonderful because it's, you know, down there it's so cold, everything is very well and well preserved. So you've got the old dog kennels are still outside, and then inside, pretty much everything. You know, the New Zealand, the New Zealanders took everything out of the hut and took it back to New Zealand, made sure it was properly looked after, properly logged. But they took pictures of where it was when they moved it from the hut, and it's all gone back into exactly the same places, including the food. There's lots of food around the walls, which is, you know, well, probably still fine to eat if you go into the things. So it was very exciting going and visiting Shackman's hut itself. We, however, were based out of Wingmurdo and we were, um, we used, we got lots of cooperation. We were diving about 15 miles from Wingmurdo and we would get ready every day. We almost swapped day for night, but now we're into 24 hour daylight. And what we wanted to film was kind of more active at night. A lot was light all the way around. The animals still follow a diurnal rhythm. And the light is a little bit softer, a little bit less harsh through the night. So we our day would start about four o'clock in the afternoon. We would get up, get ourselves prepared, load all our stuff into the piston bully, and we would drive out to our to our site where we were going to do some filming of the wedding seals. So we would get there about six or seven o'clock in the evening and we'd begin to film. Now, Weddell seals, the big difference between the Antarctic and the Arctic, as far as the animals are concerned, is there's no polar bears in the Antarctic. So the animals that live on the surface, the seals, the penguins and things, are just pretty much unafraid of human beings. You know, these seals will just lie there. This is shot almost with standard lens from the end of it. I mean, if seals were dogs, then Weddell seals would be Labradors, basically. <laughs> really easy going, really easy going seals. And even when they have their pups, they're still easy going <laughs> seals. And the pups are born in October, and um, they stick with their mum for about seven weeks, um, by which time they're weaned. Uh, when they're about a month old, they'll go into the water. This is quite a young one, this one here is about a week old, and it's just having its suckle. Now, what's interesting about Weddell seals, think about this. The daytime temperature, when these seals might be, seals run, it's that again. Weddell seals are warm-blooded, like we are, a little bit warmer than we are. We are 38.4, seals are about 40, pushing on 40. 
When that seal was born, it's quite possible that the air temperature was minus 40. So in the mere act of being born, that seal has gone through 80 degrees centigrade temperature change from inside its mum at plus 40 to outside its mum at minus 40 on the ice. And yet, you see very few frozen to death wearing seal pups. Because as soon as they're born with a layer of blubber, and the minutes of being born, they're up there suckling at their mum's milk. And that milk is extremely rich. We wanted to dive in the water with the Weddell seal. So again, with the Americans, it's not like you. You don't do diving by half measures. This is what you take when you want to go and make a dive off the Myrtle. You take your D-line, your hole driller, and then your dive off. When you get onto site, you put the business end onto the hole driller. <laughs> and the guy swings it upright, and he goes through three to four metres of ice in about three minutes without a problem. And that's you got your dive hole, you know, just like that. Um, very quick, very easy, and you can cut several dive holes. Underneath the ice, the Weddell seals are beginning to establish, the male timbers are starting to establish their territory round about the dive holes that the females are using. So when they get a new dive hole produced, when they, um, as you go down, it's not uncommon, within about three minutes, there'll be a Weddell seal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, thinking, what's going on here? And I'll be trying to maintain my dive holes all through the winter, new guys come along and suddenly there's holes all over the place. So, um, you know, you cut a few holes there, once you got, once you got a hole in the right place, then you can take the equipment out of the piston bully and you put it inside the dive hole. And this is the dive hut. And this is the situation inside the dive hut. So you've lifted the two panels in the floor, which exposes the hole that you've just cut. Inside the hut, there's a big radiator, a big um, propane gas driven radiator at one end. So inside the dive hut, it's as warm as you want to crank it up to be. So outside, minus 25, in the dive hut, as warm as you want to, in the water, minus 1.8. But with that system, you can make three, three one-hour dives a day. You make a dive for an hour, come up, a little bit chilled, take your gear off, have a look at what you've shot, rewarm, back down again for another one, save again. So we would do that, like I say, having left the base at four o'clock in the afternoon, we'd get on location about six, we would do our three dives over the course of the next nine or ten hours, and we'd pack up and we'd be back in base by about eight o'clock in the morning, um, seven o'clock in the morning, back to bed, and the whole thing would repeat itself. So there I am, <coughs> putting on the dry suit, drop into the water, and then just sort of exhale, take the camera. Now underwater cameras are heavy on land, but they're neutral underwater. You know, if you pick up an underwater camera, that one weighs about 30 kilograms on land, but it's like a ship. When you put it in the water, it's trimmed off so it's neutral, it floats. Well, it doesn't float, it stays just neutral. It shouldn't tip forward, shouldn't tip back, shouldn't particularly sink, shouldn't float, shouldn't roll on its side. You can just, in calm water, you just hold it and you let it go and it just stays there. So that, very easy to move around. In a current, you're just going to move it against the current and things, put a drag on it, but basically you're okay. So you exhale with your stuff, <laughs> you go down through the, the tunnel, through the, the hole that you've just cut, and you merge underwater into the underwater scene in McMurdo. Now what makes McMurdo special is, anyone who's dived here, anyone who's dived on a coral reef, 60 metres is exceptional visibility underwater for a coral reef, 200 feet. That feels like you can see forever. Underwater at McMurdo, the underwater visibility at this time of year, is 600 metres. It really is the clearest gin clear water in the world anywhere, and for various reasons. One reason is some of the water that's come into McMurdo Sound has spent two or three years flowing underneath the Ross Ice Shelf. All the particles have dropped out, all the no plankton growth, nothing. Through the winter, obviously, no surge, no swell. So it's just very, very, very clear water. And you can swim under the ice without any safety lines because there's no currents there. Um, we were able to swim without safety lines, which was fine, that was the way that the Americans did it. Um, but it was just wonderful to get around there. And you could follow the cracks <clears throat> along here, looking for the breathing holes where the Weddell seals were maintaining their breathing holes through the winter. Pretty laid back, even the males, you know, not too excited when you come close. And sometimes you find <coughs> males and them, um, you know, um, cubs with their moms in the water. And so this is what we put together. Just let you see. This is a lot better. Antarctica. The Earth's coldest continent. The one that is most hostile to life. Here, 
1,300 kilometers from the South Pole, it's 40 degrees below zero. Of all the millions of species of animals on Earth, only one can live here permanently. A Weddell Sea. She can survive because she can dive below the ice. Here she is protected from the storms above and here too she can find food. But she is a man and she has to breathe air. So she has to keep a lifeline open to the world above the ice. Not only for her, but now for her newborn pup. encourages him to take his first plunge, but hardly surprisingly, he's not keen. <laughs> now, guided by his mother, he has to learn how to hunt underwater and to find his way back through the maze to his hole in the ice. Closer than that is the fear. Um, so I count myself very lucky having spent so much time 
down in the pool so we can give them the chance to do things like swim with the waves, etc, etc. And also see fantastic behaviours like the killer whales, etc. Um, so it certainly I feel as though we should be doing all we're doing now and much, much more to control climate change around the world so that we keep environments like that for the animals that we've got. Um, so that's all. I, I'm um, finishing now. I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, I've got a book next door if anyone wants to have a copy of it. I'm happy to sign it for you. But I don't know if we've got any time for questions. No, we haven't got any time for questions. <laughs> It's a wonderful book, so make sure you get a chance to get a sign before you go. Um, thanks for everyone for the, for the morning sessions. We have a few little things to do before we leave, and we'll let you out as soon as we can. Um, icebreaker is Mark McLean. Uh, we announced this yesterday, uh, but unfortunately he was on the bus to Kilkeen, when we announced that we had nine wonderful icebreaker presentations uh, yesterday, and uh, the winner by adjudication for us. Uh, highly factual uh, and controversial and uh, intensively researched melodramatic erotic presentation was Rob Stevenson. Amundsen. 
<laughs> One or two resonances kind of during the talks today about what the Trust is, is doing, and I don't want to go into detail, but we had uh, a talk about sustainability, uh, and it's just worth mentioning that we are uh, we are organising a science workshop in, in Bremen uh, in January. Um, no, no earth-shattering discoveries at all on the, on the expedition, but the Weddell Sea is under research, uh, and this is an opportunity for the kind of scientists to come, come together and share uh, that little bit of extra knowledge. Uh, we're, we've also made a priority for, of education and outreach uh, during and after the expedition, and uh, there are five educational videos almost kind of ready for uh, for distribution and marketing, probably through the Royal Geographical Society, but we will certainly send them uh, to the team here in Athai uh, to say, you know, can you, can you use these things? Um, and the, the final thing, being a Scot, uh, although I'm going to uh, give something, uh, I also want to ask something first. Um, we're, we don't say much about the documentary, which is now under preparation. Uh, I have to say the di director, Matt Hewitt, uh, who is now engaged in New York in, in, in the editing, uh, would have loved to be here. She really would. She's got strong views on women in exploration. She would have loved to hear uh, Astrid's um, presentation. Um, Nat Geo are putting a lot of resource uh, into research uh, in archives. Uh, and uh, interviews uh, in order to ensure two things, historical accuracy, which they're very committed, but also to see if they can find some little new nugget. Uh, and I know that they've already found some, uh, some interesting material elsewhere, and they have established a very good link, relationship, uh, with the team here in the thigh. Uh, but they asked us if we would kind of issue an appeal. It's quite a long text, so the record will show I've read it out, but of course I won't. Uh, but the, the appeal, sorry, which will go on the, on the, on the website, um, and this is plastic. Um, the appeal is for anyone who knows of or has audio tapes uh, or interviews with anyone who participated in the Endurance 22 uh, expedition. Uh, they would love to hear you, hear from you through Kevin or Mark or me. We'll abandon the plastic wall. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yeah, all, all Antarctica. And, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, That's fine. So I don't need the plastic anymore. That's, uh, yeah, contact Kevin, Mark, or, or me about that. And, and then the final thing is the kind of two forms of thank you. Uh, one is that uh, I'd like to go and give the, the museum to, to place somewhere this first in cover that Bob Headland has brought down from, from Spry. Uh, it's signed by significant participants in the uh, expedition, including uh, Captain Bengu, who Menson mentioned, signed by Menson himself, uh, by John Shears and others. So and that's what I'll do. being here kind of the last one on the platform uh, to, to say thank you. Um, the participants here have had an extraordinary uh, kind of couple of days, day and a half of yeah, yeah, yeah. lectures of quite outstanding mm. quality yeah. uh, from impressive individuals uh, and I th I'd just like the audience to thank those, the participants, the lecturers uh, and also, and I'm not going to name names because you always get it wrong, you forget but you know who you are, the people who have organized this uh, autumn school, the first live one post-COVID, and it has just been a memorable oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, So just to thank you all for coming for the weekend, it's the end of the lecture series. Thank the lecturers, the museum staff, the volunteers, Bethany there to do all our social media stuff. Also to mention Katie and um, Eva who are volunteers as well there. Uh, Kathleen, Margaret, Sinead and Clem Rose particularly. Clem has worked extremely hard for the last week or so. Putting in place the exhibition, set up these rooms, he's done a power amount of work. Special thanks to Clem Roach particularly. 
Um, we have our film tonight at 8 o'clock, a couple of tickets still available, do buy those as well. Our bus tour at 2 o'clock as well. Anything else we want to say? No, I'm just checking my father to make sure I've said everything else. Uh, look, thanks, thanks very much for coming. Thanks, Frank, of course, for sitting here at the age of 80. <laughs> anyway,